Hey, welcome to the Smart Tech Podcast. I'm Nick Pino, the EMF guy, and I'm here with Anjan Kara. He's the visionary founder behind Daylight Computer. You're gonna learn it's not a you're gonna learn about the fact that this is not a standard computer, guys. This is a new computing company that does very unique products. Uh Anjan, thank you so much for taking the time. Thanks, Nick. It's okay. um it's it's awesome to be here. Uh because your podcast in so many ways is an emblem of the principles that we're trying to apply to reinvent computing. Thank you. Uh, and, you know, I started this work around EMFs in late 2016, very frustrated that uh, there's no such thing as a low EMF computer. There's no such thing as a low EMF tablet. There's really not that many options when it comes to lower EMF phones. And then I saw a lot of people asking me, Nick, What's the lowest EMF computer? What's the lowest EMF phone? And my answer was, well, there's there's pretty much none. And we were in a space where so many people were talking about millions of people worldwide who were very aware that uh, blue light from computers is detrimental. Hence, you know, these blue light blocking glasses that try to offset this problem. But I don't see, you know, my Asus display in front of me. I don't see Asus coming up with a no blue light or maybe you know a display where there's a button on there click and and it becomes orange for my eyes so i don't see them you know we need this product here the if you're listening to it i'm showing my blue light blocking glasses and anjan has the red version but i don't see these companies taking these ideas and incorporating them inside their products sure you had apple computers that uh, on on the iPhone they did the night shift but even then you know it's it's not it, they're not even going with a, a, a vast reduction in the amount of blue light that we know that is detrimental so i feel like it's a it's kind of a a trick they're playing on the market kind of greenwashing but it's like safe tech washing so let's let's go back to square one because some people have not heard about daylight i know many people did but what did you create there? Who are you? And what is this new product or let's say this new company? Let's start there. Nice. Um, it's fun to talk about the origins of it because I feel so much of technology is about the tech first. It's about the vision first. Oh, in Star Wars, they had that. We want to create that. Oh, we, in Star Trek, they had that. We want to create that. Oh, I want to be AI for blah, blah, blah. And it's, it's the tech first and the vision first. And um, maybe it's scarier of an approach. Maybe, well, it's not maybe. It is way harder of an approach to attract investment and things like that. But I think what tech really needs, and I was desperate enough to do it, is to work backwards from actual problems. And so the point of daylight is I was just um, fed up with my relationship with my computer. It just dramatically impacted my physical health and dramatically impacted my mental health. And the the original promise of computers is it can make you the best version of yourself. If you have this much output, this is your potential. You, you, you have so much more that's possible. And a computer, as Steve Jobs called it, a bicycle for the mind. You know, you can only run so fast as a human, but if you have a bicycle, you can go much faster for much longer. Same thing with a computer. You can you can be more brilliant. That poetry, more poetry can come out of you. More science papers can be discovered. More great books can be read. More great ideas can be put together. And that's just not the case. And it's not even the case in the in the like in 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 the sense that you can be more productive, it's not even just like it's missing a positive. It's actually giving you a negative. Yeah. The blue light, the EMFs, the being stuck inside all day, not being in touch with natural circadian rhythms, the bad ergonomics of it, the eye strain of it. And then the mental side, being absolutely distracted uh, and inter interrupted and addicted by screen time that's not in your best intention. It was just, it got into a breaking point where I was, I felt like I faced a choice. I either can be a victim to technology and I had seasonal affective disorder. So being inside, I would get very depressed. My vitamin D levels were clinically low, which also correlates with depression. Mm -hmm. And so I can continue to be inside and feel like crap. Um, my eyes 
that it hurt so much from spending time on computers that they, I got tested for glaucoma and then the blue light would just wreck my um, mood. It would make me hungry for food, for uh, dopamine. Uh, it changed my baseline. It messed up my sleep. I would often sleep really late and get up really late. And you're desynchronized from the rest of society and you're desynchronized from your own cycles. You know, so I had digestive issues. I had tiredness issues. There's a huge, huge set of metabolic and conditions that come from messing up your circadian rhythms. And so I, I could, I, I could either just say this is my reality and deal with it or say, no, this is not, this is not what computers have to be. This is people designing computers. So they look good in ads. This is people designing computers. So they're fun at candy crush. This is just people designing computers that people will buy. Cause they go, Ooh, shiny. Even if it has all of these side effects, even if it has all these externalities to your health, because for whatever reason we blame ourselves we feel like okay we have to buy blue blocking glasses and then we have to do all of these things and it feels like the core insight of daylight was the desperation of whether it's true or not i feel like the computer's got to do something different it can't always just be our fault and so that's what daylight is is trying to bring agency back and bring the values of mental health and physical health and true productivity back to computing and reinvent a computer with, okay, it has to respect your health because even if it did everything else, but it hurt your health, nothing, it doesn't matter. This is why rich people spend all their time on health because they've, they've conquered every other area of life, right? This is literally just a fact of reality. And so yeah. if we can create healthier computers that then don't affect your mental health or distract you, and then actually allow you to be uniquely productive, what's possible in society. And uh, it's it's a truly about sovereignty and being kind of decentralized and having agency and uh, reclaiming of what matters, which has got to start with health. Yeah, this is brilliant. So <clears throat> I know you started many years ago. Uh, what is your background? Uh, yeah. uh, what, how many years ago did you start in tech? I started working on this specific company and product in 2018, mid 2018. So in 2018, six years, six years to get the launch. For um, sure. And uh, so you started having this idea about a computer. What made you want to put certain features, like, for example, trying to eliminate these blue light emissions? How did you become aware that this was a problem just through, you know, mainstream? I know now Harvard talks about it, so it's fairly mainstream at that point. But is there one source in particular that made you aware of, uh, let's say, the blue light problem? I think it started with my actual just lived experience. Yeah. Um, I just sat down and compared. I was just like, what? Why do I feel so bad? My eyes hurt. My sleep is screwed up. My mood is bad when I use my normal computers. But then when I print something out or even use my Kindle, I feel so much better. My eyes don't hurt. My, I actually sleep on time. I, I can spend time outdoors. Um, my mood is better. I got my feet in the dirt. Um, like what's going on here? And so I, start, I, I like consistently started to realize I would like sleep at like two or 3 a.m. if I was using an iPad, using the Kindle app. But if I was to use the Kindle app on my Kindle, I sleep at like midnight, 11. Like I conk out. And so I was like, what's going on? And so I just started to really investigate the differences between, it turns out the Kindle is a type of screen technology called reflective screens or e-paper. And normal screens are a type of screen technology called transmissive or emissive screens. And I went on a big rabbit hole then about blue light and circadian rhythms and light. And I think most people stop at blue light and sleep, but man, it, it's, it's a much deeper, it's a much deeper topic when you start getting into the way it affects your mitochondria and metabolism and mood. And uh, along the ways um, I learned about non-native EMFs and uh, about grounding and um, just some of these frontier modalities where the science isn't fully fleshed out, but if you just try it yourself, you can't claim for everybody that it works or is helpful, but you can start to notice in your own mood, in your own energy, in your own tiredness. So I think it was a lot of self-science of, hey, I don't know what's true, but I'm going to try all the things. And um, 
I just, yeah, I really hit the books. I'm, I come from a background in health technology and medical technology. So I trust myself to kind of read books in neuroscience and books and circadian rhythms and books about morphogenesis and different electrical, you know, the Robert O. Becker type stuff. Uh, so. And and what's your education like? Are you electrical engineering or I cannot read computer engineering? I, I would call it dilettante engineering where I, uh, designed my own degree okay <laughs> so so it was a it was a combination of mechanical electrical computer science bioengineering psychology just all over the place so jack of all trades master of none um i really don't actually like engineering and don't really think of myself as an engineer i okay. i far more identify as like a scientist but um i quickly realized science only matters in so much as you can translate it and translation is engineering skill and so even if I don't like engineering, it would be pretty helpful to kind of be competent in it. So, so. Yeah, well, and it gives you a background, I think, uh, to be crazy enough to want to design a computer from scratch, right? So, so okay, 2018, you start having this idea. It took around six years to bring it to reality. Yeah. What What are you looking for at first? Like, I guess you, how do you create a computer? Like, I guess, just give us like the 30,000 feet view. I mean, I, yeah, I, right? I, I can I can guess what's involved, but yeah. just the creation, the ideation, and then trying to find funding for such a project must oh, be yeah. uh, next to impossible. Yeah, I'm wondering if I was to label it as chapters, how would I call it? Well, I'd say the quote unquote prologue is just maximum depression, desperation, pain with computers. I just got to the point where I never get my work done. I have 500 tabs open. My sleep was messed up. I felt like crap. I was like, this can't be the rest of my life. Mm -hmm. I call chapter one is do everything in your power to not invent a computer. Because <laughs> from that summer of 2018 until call it January, February 2019, I actually was just trying to get every possible solution uh, to work. That wasn't me inventing it because I'm, I'm I'm just trying to solve my problem. I'm actually not trying to reinvent a computer. I'm just trying to solve my relationship with that. So I bought every single e-ink device possible. I bought printers. I bought scanners. I bought different shielding tech. I bought different blue blockers. I bought different grounding cats. I, I just, I tried everything. I literally tried so many different modalities of trying to go analog, so many different e-ink computers and tablets and things. And um, I actually ended up, we ended up working for almost like a year on reinventing, like hacking on existing e-ink computers, like the remarkable tablet to try to make it work. And so long story short is none of it worked. None of it worked. Even our hacks did not work. And so chapter two was um, basically along the same time, I was diving really deep into the display world, especially into this concept of e-paper displays or healthier displays. And uh, uh, I'll call it the... Finding the chapter two would be finding something in the garbage heap where I found an old technology that was over 30 years old that had been thrown away. And um, it was thrown away because it had all of these flaws. It had these eight flaws. And then I just dove deep into the literature and I was like, ooh, this paper from 1994 solves one of those flaws. Ooh, this paper from 1997, from 2002, from 2004, from 2008, from 2012, 2015, and 2018. And long story short, I was convinced that the state of the art of the literature showed that on paper, this old, old technology that had was useless actually could be resurrected. And so chapter three then was commercializing this academic literature. I went and to the Netherlands, I went to Germany, I went to Taiwan, I went to Japan. Japan was the most crucial place where the core researchers were. I went to the display conferences. I spent time with the professors. I spent time with this Japanese professor um, uh, developing a proof of concept, showing that you could actually commercialize it, showing that you could put all of these different things together. And so that was my core invention is kind of figuring out all these different material science innovations from different times and eras and fields and pulling it together. And then chapter three was the kind of the birth of the concept was like first this little, little square. It was like that big that proved that you could actually make a, a blue light free, flicker free, um, outdoor, like visible high refresh rate computer. And then that was kind of like, um, uh, that was like, uh, that was like, a 
almost it's, it's almost till end of 2020 uh, is when we did that. And then the next year for 2020 to the end of kind of fall of 2021 was then taking that little square that's like a scientific proof of concept and turning it into the first prototype, like a basic working tablet. And uh, that was very, very, very difficult. And uh, we had no money. So I just burned through my entire life savings to do this. Um, and so we had, we finally had one, like we a kind of duct taped together, built out of a lab prototype. Um, and you know anything about hardware, it's, it's extremely hard to make something work, but it's even harder to make it work a lot of times, right? Like go from a lab bench prototype to doing it in production. Yeah. And so, um, it's kind of like your reward for beating winning the video game in hardware is you get an even harder level. I guess that's most of life, but you feel it very strongly when you're like, woohoo, Eureka, we invented a we invented a healthier computer. And then you find out that's just the beginning of the journey. Yeah. So then we we went bankrupt. We got lucky. We found a couple of angel investors um to kind of save us. Uh it was times were desperate in 2021. We had some of the team, it was just the three of us. We had the other two members of the team. I um go on unemployment because they would get more money from unemployment than from working at the company. And so they, uh, they were uh, um, unemployed, so to speak, <laughs> while we were trying to make this happen. And then uh, we got lucky. We started showing the prototype to the right people and we started to get some angel investors to give us money. And then from the beginning of 22, all the way until 20 to like, you know, this May, 2024, it was like two years to, get that prototype into production, uh, develop it. There's a lot of things you need to do to develop something to be ready to be produced. And then the actual time it takes to work things out with the factory and start scaling it. You find all these problems and translating it. What worked on a lab bench doesn't work at scale or it'll cost $3,000. And then, um, that, yeah, we call that chapter, um, getting it to reality. And then we launched in May. And so now it's real. Yeah, and to give people some perspective, uh, there's going to be a, a link to videos you have on your website about how the display looks like. But you showed me the display. When was it? Uh, a few months ago? Was it in February or before that we met? Yeah. Or, so, yeah. so you told me he, th this this random guy, Engine Kata, emails <laughs> me and he's like, I got to show you something or someone introduced me. I cannot even recall at this point. But it, like, I got to show you something. Let's do a call. And when someone tells me, Nick, let's do a call, normally I'm I'm like, oh my God, I gotta, <laughs> you know, do the podcast and write and research and this. And right. I don't like to just do a call. What is it for? But when I took the call in a coffee shop and he shows me the display, looks like an iPad, but when you put it in the straight sun, you can still see it 100%. And that's one of the frustrations, even looking at an iPhone or any phone for that matter, in very bright sun, you can barely see the display, even maximum brightness. And here it was, this high refresh rate display that looks just like a, a display with the same speed. So you can display like a Zoom video or you know a 4K video on it, but it was paper-like. And it was almost surreal. Sure. The impression I had was that in real time, you were using Photoshop to Photoshop your Zoom call. <laughs> because I'm like, wait a minute, I never saw a paper-like display that actually refreshes this way and 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 that can be seen in the sun. Like, it, it doesn't exist. And that was really my first impression was like, this is almost magic because it's a new technology that never, never was created before. And I was shocked. I was like, wait a minute, this is very important. And I, I tried to introduce you to a few people and I tried to help the best I can. And I, and eventually it led to this podcast right now. So I'm I'm very excited to to know a part of your story. So I don't know how much you, you want to talk about that, but I know you've had certain investors meetings where you kind of saw the culture in Silicon Valley uh, or in tech where... What was the reaction from some potential investors when you tell them we're gonna do this display and the reason we do it is because it's it's healthier, not sexier, not more addictive than before, which is kind of the standard these days. So we want kind of health to be one of the first values for the company. So uh, I in other interviews I heard you talk about the fact that 
some of these people were very money driven and kind of kind of scoffed or, or laughed at this idea of health. So are these people so disconnected that they don't see this future of safer tech and healthier tech being a possibility? I think this is such a beautiful question because it almost reveals why the world is the way it is. I think we often come away being like, gosh, the world must be run by evil people because there's all this stuff that is clearly hurting ourselves and our yeah. families and our children. So there's no way this can happen unless they must be evil. They don't care. Um, I think the extremely heartbreaking aspect of the world was it's the way it is because of cowardice, not because of evil. At least in my experience, what I saw over and over again from executives of these big tech companies or more specifically to your question, investors was cowardice. So I, I would basically what we'd invented is the first healthy computer screen technology. You know, it's blue light free. You can use it in the sun. It doesn't strain your eyes. It doesn't have flicker. Um, and at nighttime, it can optionally be lit with a pure amber, no blue light um, light as well. And so the trade-off with that is it's black and white, right? So it's like literally giving up color, literally giving up like stuff that is appealing and attractive and stimulating, you know, like good luck going to a candy store that's black and white. It's not as interesting, like, yeah. right. Or, or Disneyland. And so that that's the crux of our thing is, Hey, it's kind of more boring as a computer. It only does the basics or the essentials. You can do everything the computer can do, but it's black and white. So therefore it's, you know, minimal. I think that's still worth it. I think health matters so much. It's okay to give away shininess, to give away something that's super stimulating, something that's super saturated. Like, I don't need that. And so when you would go to people, what was so heartbreaking is at some level they'd say, oh my God, I so agree with you. That's what I want for myself. That's what I want for my children. But... I don't know if the world uh, is smart enough to know to prioritize their health over something that's shiny. Uh, I don't. Um, I don't invest in things that are so optimistic about the human condition. I invest in sin. Really. Literally, there's a famous quote by the guy who runs Sequoia Capital, the most famous venture capital firm, says, I always try to pattern recognize an investment against the seven deadly sins. Which sin does it actually play towards? And dude, when you hear it that plainly, how does that not make you absolutely infuriated and absolutely heartbroken? Because they literally were like, I'll be your five first customer. I'll buy it. I want this for my kid. But, you know, the rest of the world. And so actually what was at the core of it is a lack of belief in people's ability to change their life. That's actually the core sin of technology is they're like, oh, behavior change is really hard. So we're going to do the easy thing of pandering. And I was like, do you understand what you guys are saying? You guys are like saying, oh, it's really hard to like, become friends with kids if you bring like hummus and carrots. So anytime like, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm meeting my nephews or nieces, I'll just bring candy. Yeah. Because of course they're gonna love me if I bring candy. And that's what tech is. They're just like, I'll pander to you. I'll just play to the fact that you like things that are shiny or sexy or sweet, you know? You don't, you're, you're not smart enough to actually have a, to understand what matters to you. And that, to me, Nick, is the most frustrating, terrifying, makes me so angry and also gives me so much hope that if people like ourselves, people from our tribe, our community, our values, where we're like, no, we actually learned and educated ourselves in what matters. So I don't just want the appearance of a good life that you're selling me. I actually want the good life. And if the good life means doing things that are less sexy, but actually way more real, like caring about your health, you know, caring about your attention, caring about the quality of the materials that you're using and how natural they are, then I will do that. And so um, I think a lot of the reason we are using unhealthy technologies and computers is because they're convinced that people are dumb. People always pick appearances over substance. 
Hey, I need to interrupt this podcast for just a second. I want to tell you about one of the EMF protection or health supporting products I really believe in and which help finance the costs associated with this show. One of the very best ways to know for sure what kind of EMF radiation levels you're being exposed to at home or at work is to hire what's called an EMF mitigation specialist. And some of the very best specialists in this type of work in North America are Brian Hoyer and his team from Shielded Healing. And here's what's uh, what shielded healing can do for you. They can come to your home, they take EMF readings uh, using professional level equipment that is, and they identify the worst sources of EMFs that you can turn off and help you create a safer, calmer, and health supporting bedroom and entire home. Uh, Brian has personally mitigated the homes and offices of the very best functional medicine doctors in the world, like Dr. Ben Lynch, Dr. Joseph Mercola, and many others, and he's always at the cutting edge of the latest mitigation strategies, including how to shield against 5G. To learn more about Shielded Healing and if Brian's team might be doing consultations in your area soon, mainly in the U.S., just go to theemfguy.com slash shieldedhealing and you can use the coupon code SMARTER at checkout to get 10% off a consultation or shielding materials. That's SMARTER at checkout for 10% off. And remember, creating a cleaner EMF environment at home is an investment you're making towards your long-term wellness and happiness. Okay, back to the podcast. Yeah. And, you know, it. <clears throat> some people at the end of their life, unfortunately, you know, jobs passed away with uh, with chronic illness and was not able to to go back to good health. And, and way too soon, uh, I think he was a genius inventor. But at the same time, health was not the top priority when it comes to Apple. And these days, it's still about programmed obsolescence replacing your phone every what is it now 30 days i don't know as much as possible and then the <laughs> telecoms participate in that where no just you know take your old phone send it back we're gonna trash it somewhere and you have like you're gonna have a garbage patch of iphones somewhere in the world we don't even know what happens once we toss it out and it, it doesn't matter because now we have the 15 oh no wait uh 15 c no wait 15 x oh no wait it's 70 it's, it's like it, it never stops so even that aspect of technology is quite destructive and and it's uh not something that is uh talked about enough but i don't i don't want to go too much towards that because I want to focus on the Daylight Tablet, which is your first product. I know it's certainly not the last. Uh, the Daylight Tablet, you mentioned the display, which is a huge part of what the product is all about. You can bring it outside. So portability and also being able to use it in nature. It's like I this summer, uh, you, you were uh, very gracious to uh, send me a tablet to try. I'm going to use it this summer. Just go to Jerry Park here and, you know, Maybe have certain sessions where I can brainstorm and just you know write things, but it will be a, a way um, a, a way for me to be distraction free. I don't even have access to my everyday apps and notifications and stuff like that, which is good. I don't have access to my two displays, and I'm in nature, so I'm spending more time outside. So that's a huge benefit. But what about other features that uh, you have been thinking about incorporating in a tablet? Because for my tribe, at least, there's going to be questions around, can this tablet be hardwired, for example? So uh, what is it, USB-C, and does it have Ethernet? And then also address kind of what kind of apps can be installed in there. I think it's based on Androids, but let, let's go into the tablet a little bit more to sure. uh, dive deep. So the, the basic idea was, hey, how do I make a healthier computer that also respects my mental health? and hopefully makes me more productive. That was kind of the thing. Um, I decided that the light is the most important thing to get started with, because that is what most affected me. And so the core, core, core emphasis over this last couple of years was inventing a computer display that allowed me to be in more natural light, i.e. the sun, i.e. outside, and removed chunk light. So it was blue light free and flicker free. 
And that's the core invention is you can almost think of our thing as like an iPad where you rip out the iPad screen and you put in the daylight screen. We call the technology live paper because it's like a piece of paper that's alive. Nice. Um, and so that's really all about light. Um, on the software side, what you're able to do is you can have access to all of your favorite apps. Um, if there's an Android app for it, if there's a web app for it, you'll be able to do it. So whether that's ChatGPT, that's Spotify, that Microsoft Word, or your email, or um, Google Classroom, if you're a student, um, you'll be able to almost almost everything will be accessible for you to be able to do. But now you'll get it with you know the benefits of being able to use it outdoors without blue light, without flicker. Um, next on the list after light though is um, EMFs is about the way it interacts with you uh, as an electromagnetic being. And so we have a lot planned in future products, um, but the kind of the current interventions that were, um, that we think are exciting that you're able to do with this is the first one is because you're able to use it outdoors, um, you can actually be grounding while you're using the product. And so I think that's particularly unique. There isn't really many other computers that you can use outside of the direct sun that's and right. have your feet in the dirt and ground. And so um, I think that's the first kind of great benefit of this towards EMFs is you can ground while using it. The, the second one is you can use, uh, you can hardwire it, um, use a Ethernet to USB-C uh, adapter and then be able to plug into the tablet. And so Perfect. you'd ever need to actually use it with Wi-Fi and a bunch of our early folks use it as such. Uh, the third is you can, we put something called pogo pins on the back of it. And essentially what that allows for is in the future, not right now, in the future, it'll allow you to um, have accessories. And so basically what it'll do is when you have it coming through the USB-C, sometimes that can be a little bit annoying because the cable is like here. And so the pogo pins allow that cable to be on the back of the tablet. And so rather than being out right here, which, you know, if I'm reading like this, the cable can come in the way actually behind this case are some pogo pins. So the cable could be here. So I have no problem reading. And so it's just like a quality of life improvement that I feel like no other tablet um, has in terms of how it can be hardwired. Sure. And so that's the kind of third thing. Um, the fourth thing is we are using a passive stylus technology. So when you're using an iPad and Apple Pencil, there is electronics in the stylus. Um, there is a Bluetooth chip and things like that. This has no electronics. This has no battery. This never needs to be charged. And so what that means is if you are electrosensitive, um, you don't need to potentially touch the tablet directly with your finger and touch the capacitive screen. You can just hold this thing, which is inert, and then you can use that to touch. And I think that's very promising for electrosensitive folks because now you don't need to actually touch the electro, um, the capacitive sure. screen. That's a strategy that many people told me to use with phones and tablets and you know right. anything that is touch screen and that helps. They just don't feel good having this electricity course through the finger. So that might seem right. extreme to some people listening to this, but the degree of EMF let's say reactivity that some people can have is quite profound. And that's just uh, yeah. quite, that's very unfortunate that we've come to that, but for some people it's right. getting worse. So they, they do I, need uh, this, uh, this kind of pencil and can, can right. Wi-Fi? The, oh, please so, go ahead. I was just going to say the way I think about it is if it's helpful for you, you can use it as such. If that doesn't matter, the benefit to you is you never need to charge your stylus, right? It's never out of charging. So the way we think a lot of these things is how do you kill two birds with one stone? Yeah, that's well. That's perfect. And you know, charging charging things all the time. Why do you need Bluetooth in a in a pan anyway? I mean, it's what? Why do I need Bluetooth in my new dishwasher? Right? <laughs> it's, it's 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 always like everything is moving in this direction of of like, right. well, let's have a wireless chip in there. Why again? Oh, because it's cool. <laughs> it's a trendy thing to do. So I'm glad that you guys are very conservative on things. And what about turning off Wi-Fi and Bluetooth? Uh, is this just something in a menu, very simple to do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's the last thing I was gonna share is you can use it similar to other things is you can put into airplane mode and completely turn off Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. And we made it pretty easy to access airplane mode. But the other thing, it's um, we're, we're trying to build it out well. So it's taking time, but the thing that we have in the works is something we call the smart airplane mode. 
And so the basic insight of smart airplane mode is on a normal device, by default, you're connected, and then you have to go out of your way to go onto airplane mode. Uh, we want to flip that on its head. So in smart airplane mode, by default, the device will be in airplane mode, and it will automatically go off airplane mode when you need to do something that involves the internet. So in smart airplane mode, when you're writing the email, the thing will be in airplane mode. But when you hit send, it'll turn on the Wi-Fi, send the email, and then turn it back off and go back to airplane mode. And so our basic insight is a lot of the time when you're on a computer, your Wi-Fi is on, but you're not actually doing anything with the internet, right? If you're reading a book page or you're writing in Microsoft Word or you're scrolling through a website that's already loaded, you don't really need the internet. It's only when you're downloading or sharing or opening something new or you know modifying something. So the part of smart airplane mode is it basically knows that hey, you don't need internet right now and puts it into smart uh, puts it into smart airplane mode. And then when you're opening a new tab or typing something in or sending that email, it'll turn on. And the hope is that will reduce how much the Wi-Fi is on or irradiates you like 90%, maybe 95%. Um, we're not specific. So we think that's a huge breakthrough. Um, we don't know any other uh, computer that does this. And what makes this possible is we control the operating system, the software, the applications, and the hardware. And so I think that's what you were getting excited about, Nick, is when you do have the capabilities of Apple where you can do the entire computing stack, and not many people can do that. Some people can make new hardware. They can't do software. Some people can do software. They can't do hardware. But when you do all of this, you can do new, unique features that allow you to have a still great computing experience, but kind of with very little trade-off, make it healthier. Yeah, this is brilliant. And you know, something that I've been I've been discussing this very idea, I think, in, in 2017, where I said, guys, instead of having things always on, always emitting and sometimes right. off. It needs to be always off and sometimes on. <laughs> and that's exactly yes. what, that, yes. that's almost verbatim what I said like eight, almost eight years ago. So that's exactly this idea of, okay, why again do we need a Wi-Fi router that is open while no <laughs> one is home 12 hours per day? They're gonna do their job and the Wi-Fi router is like blasting away. Right. No one is there and the neighbors might be but they cannot even connect to your machine. They don't have the password. So why again are these things emitting 24-7? I don't know. Why is, it, why is it that when you have a Bluetooth-enabled alarm clock in a hotel room, like I always see when I travel, it's always emitting and looking mm. for a phone. Instead mm. of having this little button that's called search for Bluetooth, click and then it emits a bluetooth right. signal to connect to my phone but no instead it is designed in a way that is completely stupid and that simply does not follow the principle that we should follow which is the alara principle as low as reasonably achievable when it comes to these exposures we don't need more exposure and it is very very likely if not uh, completely definitively uh, positive that if you minimize exposure you're going to feel better you're going to you're going to be in a better place this is a stressor so it's just yeah. I, i'm glad that you're flipping that on its head because it's just poor design and and i feel the reason it's poor design and engineering is that not many engineers think it, think about these things it's not part of the requirements and they just see they just say well you know what we're following fcc rules Right, or within FCC guidelines, and these uh, these guidelines have been demonstratively uh, de demonstrated to be completely bogus. But still, to this day, they still hold. So it, it's it's so permissive that it's like maximum exposure possible is almost safer. Um, and something else I that blew my mind. Um, different engineers told me that if they minimized the amount of power in phones or even cell phone towers by a couple of fold. I don't remember what it was, but it was dramatic, like two or five times, it would have the same connectivity. So mm. they're, they're way above what they need to be. And the reason Frank Frank uh, Cleggs, who's a ex CEO Microsoft Canada, who's now an, an EMF activist, has been for years for Canadians for Safe Technology, kind of completely turned around his career and realized, my God, we're wow. really, really going in the wrong direction with tech, especially wireless. He said the reason that you don't have operators that will lower the intensity of their cell phone towers 
is that the other guy is not doing it. Mm. So in other words, they're afraid that, let's say, if the intensity is 1,000 watts and I lower mm. mine to 500, and, well, let's say it hurts my connectivity, it's going to be bad for business. So if mm. the other guy is not doing it, I'm not doing it. And every company is kind of not preventatively lowering levels because it's not mandatory to do so. So they're wow. not at this point where um, I, I heard about some examples. Uh, you had the, the best developments in air filtration coming out of factories was coming from China, but not because they were especially excited to be greener than other countries just because everyone is choking to death in cities and they say, mm, we're in trouble, so we're going to develop. So that's kind of being forced to develop lower emissions that were lower than what has been mandated or what has been agreed upon in international treaties. So this is when, when lowering levels of stressors, whether it be wireless or air quality, will be something that is the logical thing to do to be either like a stronger business or... So anyway, it's just, I'm kind of rambling here, but you, you know what I'm getting at is that I think we're going to be at this point eventually, but I'm with what you're creating, it will be an example of a first company that does it. And that's po a powerful statement right there. I think you nailed it. Like it's a stressor. It's, it's a, it's a perturbation in the environment compared to what's there naturally. You don't need to have any claims about magnitude. Like it's not about like, Oh, if you do this, this will like save your life or change everything. Yeah. It's just, yeah. it's just to your point, logical. Like you remove stressors, life will get better. You like, if you remove two extra pounds from your backpack, life will get a little bit better. Right? There's an entire field called ultralight that's literally just about getting that extra weight off of it. Now, they're not going to climb the mountain like a million times better than me because I have two more pounds. But yeah, removing a load, removing a stressor is better. And I think that's what the possibility here is, Nick, is revealing to people there's a way to reduce these stressors or loads without compromising customer experience. It's not like we're asking you to not use technology. It's not like we're asking you to make huge inconveniences to your life. We're saying with minimal inconvenience, if any, a lot of the times there's no real trade-off, we're able to reduce the load or stress. And I think it's hard to argue with that. Like yeah. you're being ideological if you're arguing with that. Right. Like I think the past is it felt to your point of tinfoil. It felt like you had to you had to make huge compromises to your life to do something. And yeah. I think the existence of our company and what you're educating about is that's not the case. And it'll be increasingly less so as somebody like us who can engineer products with these yes. kind of principles and, in mind. And I don't want to toot my own horn, but I think what I wrote on the mfguy.com, let me read this uh this part. So basically I said it's in my bio. I said that my biggest goal is to incentivize tech companies, governments, regulators, and consumers alike to demand and develop technologies that are supporting the life of humans, animals, and the planet. So you can see why I was excited when you, in fact, showed me the tablet that is Amazing. part of this new. And, and I'm like, okay, well, my goal is to incentivize tech companies because I do believe that, like you said at the beginning, it's not, it shouldn't be up to consumers to protect themselves. That's ludicrous. If, if I'm like John right. and Susan who are from Colorado and, and, and just want to live a good life, why on <laughs> earth do they need to put blue blockers on and, and read the EMF guy and watch the podcast and then protect right. their children against this tech? And like, this, it shouldn't be up to them. They're already busy trying to just live a good life. Why would they spend hours being researchers on the internet, right? So it's, it's completely upside down. It should be regulatory agencies that are... Uh, uh, completely free from industry ties that actually put safety standards in place. And then companies are forced to create products that will not harm consumers. And that's it. It used to be that way, or maybe it was never quite that right. way. But I feel right. like things have been gotten, uh, have been getting so out of hand that um, right. uh, it just makes me excited when I see a company like you that is quite disruptive. And I want to be respectful of your time. Let's talk just disruption. You did a press conference and official launch 
a few weeks ago, I think at this point. What is the response in the tech space now that it's not just, oh, we have this idea or we have this proof yeah. of concept, but now the product is shipping. I don't know how many units. Can you talk about where you're at with the companies and with the Daylight Tablet and how it was received in that tech journalism space? Right. Uh, to your point, I think it's incredibly validating about how much the world wants this. And all those investors are like, eh, people, it's like, no. The the existence of podcasts and how many people listen to podcasts like yourself and you know other health ones have shut like people want to make their lives better. They don't trust companies have their best interests in mind. And we're going to create a whole new set of products and companies that actually care about humans instead of pretending to. And I think that's what the reception to our launch was. We we kind of blew up. It was pretty cool. We had five batches of products. We've almost sold all of them out. I think we have uh, we have less than half of the last batch left, which was we expected to sell like one or two batches. So that was kind of um, it's it's back ordered all the way until uh, no, November or December now, um, and so that was pretty stunning. We were on the homepage of the Verge. We were at the top of Hacker News. Um, we were kind of the the number one talk of the town in Silicon Valley as well, which is so hilarious because everybody would be like, oh, I love this, but I don't think others did. It's like finally for the first time, everybody realized, oh, wait, all of us said that. All of us want healthier computers for our kids. And so I think it's incredibly validating to The the Verge, um, which is kind of the big tech mag, uh, publication. So the number one question they've been receiving since we launched is about the daylight. Is this real? What is it like? Can you guys review it? Well, tell me more. And so, um, I think we're onto something. <laughs> How does it feel? Anticlimactic in a way, because to your point, like I think we both know, like this is the right thing to do, and regardless of whether it's well received or not, it's the right thing to do. So, in a way, it's anticlimactic. It's like the world's worse off because of ignorance. Like, God, like, every, like it, it was here. People want this. Yeah. Right. And so, um, and so anticlimactic because I'm like, it doesn't really matter whether it's received well or not. I'm going to keep working on this. I think it's important. It's, it's validating and exciting in the sense of like, wow. Now, like a lot of people potentially may even like invest in healthier technology. Cause they're like, Oh, there's a demand for this. Right. There's like, there's a ton of people want a phone, ton of people want to monitor. And so even in terms of us getting future funding and things like that, there's been a lot of offers and interest. And so hopefully now we did the hardest part, which is to prove that people care about this. And now lots of other companies and investors and so on can further and further. And I don't mean this broadly. Clearly, there's lots of health companies. But the point is in the Silicon Valley venture capital tech culture, there's like kind of this was considered like cute. And hopefully now seeing this sheer millions and millions and millions of people, I think our launch video and other demo video all together with 20 million plus impressions across uh, on Twitter. Um, wow. My God. Yeah. Like and the, the website is incredible. I mean, I don't know who you hired, who worked on that. that it's awesome. like it's as beautiful at it at, at is uh, it, it's as beautiful as simple and mm -hmm. kind of respects this this feeling of something that can be used in nature, even in the colors. It feels like, mm -hmm. a, you know, a, a moving paint for me. It was it, it, it's awesome. I spent a lot of time. It's very, very thorough. Like mm -hmm. th there's so much info just on the main web page, which which I think it's something you, you had to do to explain why is this new? And it's kind of an, a new philosophy. I think you guys nailed it. I was very impressed with it compared to before you had like like a miniature website just to show something. But now I feel like this is a mature product and it will attract a lot of attention in the future. Um and is there is there anything you can talk about when it comes to future developments? I know you mentioned uh, maybe EMFs is going to be more part of future software developments, like the smart airplane mode and things like that. So far, it's trying to expand how many tablets you can create and kind of to meet up the demand, I guess. 
Yeah, the way I think about it is kind of like there is like breadth and then there's depth. And so one avenue of what we're doing is increasing the depth per product we make. So for example, could we have healing light, like different infrared light? What can we do in terms of fully building out that smart airplane mode? Can we have that pogo pins accessory so you can be hardwired and have a better experience? You don't have a cable sticking into your stomach. Mm -hmm. I would call all those under the the banner of depth. So we have a whole set of initiatives um, and we're you know hiring new folks to help us accelerate the timeline for that on, on depth. And on breadth, it, the idea would be not just make a tablet, but make a keyboard case for the tablet so you can replace your laptop with it. So you can, you know, you can use a Bluetooth keyboard, you can use a wired keyboard. Um, we made it specifically have USB OTG, so you can use a wired keyboard, uh, you can connect to it. But having a keyboard case would be nice because then you don't, for, for some people, they don't want to use a wired keyboard and then they use a Bluetooth keyboard. If we build a keyboard case, then there's no need for wireless. It's it's a mechanical connection. Uh, so after a keyboard case, the, the kind of big product we really, really, really want to make is the phone. Because I think that could be really world changing is to have like a healthier distraction-free phone. And there's a lot of ideas there too. You can do far more in terms of this phone equivalent of a smart airplane mode. And especially, you know, phones with their antenna trying to go for four or 5g that's really really uh there's a lot more opportunity to kind of save yourself from radiation so the phone is super exciting and then a laptop a monitor kind of think of the different products in your life that are computing we're going to go and hopefully through each category and reinvent it with health as the center well, I'm excited and I, I I don't recall if you said it and I don't want to misquote you, but you said something like I don't want, I want to be the Steve Jobs of of healthy tech, you know? And I I would call you that. And it, we'll we'll see. The future will <laughs> the tell. Apple. Of course, I Jobs the, is kind of you know I, I, I that that would be arrogant to think I'm anywhere comparable even to Steve Jobs, but it's the Apple. I want to be the Apple. The Apple uh, of benefit Apple. computing. Yeah. The yeah, Apple but that's, of healthy that's tech. fine. You yeah. know, something to you can dream big. I mean, if the company becomes even a fraction of Apple, it will mean that millions of consumers around the world will be using healthier tech. And at that point, if it's in the millions of products sold, it will change the world. It will create competition. And maybe, only maybe, Apple and Samsung and all these top companies, Microsoft, will start coming up with other product lines that will be a competition to you guys and good for them totally. because it's that'd gonna be amazing. Be, you know, that'd it will be amazing. It will spark a whole new type of tech development. And maybe we'll see things that are simply incredible that, you know, the e-ink idea and in and, and your uh, life paper, I, I didn't think it was a possibility, but I didn't think that, you know, this computer was a possibility 20 years ago either. So everything goes right. fast and we can develop technology that is so much healthier and and more compatible with how humans actually function and and something i wanted to ask you about i'm almost to to close out the interview but something to consider is how can we make ethernet something that can be plugged in plugged out without breaking <laughs> because yes. look oh. ethernet to me it's a technology that was created for servers or right. consumers where yes. it's plugged in, yes. it doesn't move. Now I'm yeah. here with my Ethernet cable and it and you, breaks and it's annoying. Yes. If yes. you have oh, something that is magnetic or super easy, someone yes. that will reinvent Ethernet might make a lot of money off of this patent. I'm just saying. So just an idea. <laughs> I, I appreciate that you're ending it with a pitch. <laughs> but the thing about the pogo pins is you get to have a unique connector and experience with it as well. So not only yep. is it not stabbing you here, but you put, you can connect it in a way that's potentially like magnetic or simple. You don't need to, you know, cause yes, anybody who's ever hardwired knows you move it a bit. It disconnects, you know, it's, <laughs> Everything it's, breaks. it's not, yeah. it's not, it's not that friendly. So that's, that's, that's an amazing motivation for us to keep going. But well, Hey, that's perfect. the thing is a new computer company only comes around, you know, once every dozen years, the last one was Oculus and it went into Facebook's arms and is helping create their, you know, their, uh, put a computer on your face, you know, to have your life disappear, which you could argue is maybe one of the worst ways to interact with the computer <laughs> is strapping it onto your eyeballs. But um, yeah. it's a, it's a, it's, it's kind of a cool thing for us to 
come into the world, I hope we're able to survive and thrive. And it's only going to be because, you know, we listen to community. We listen to folks like yourself. We work together and we, we put our heads down and solve the problems that every, we all acknowledge are important. Well, thank you so much for taking the time today. Uh, I think this is a brilliant um, product, brilliant innovation. I'll be trying it out and we'll record videos on my channel as well. And then uh, people who want to try it, they can just click under the video. There's going to be a link there. Uh, it's an affiliate link. I'm affiliated with the company because it's part of uh, what helps me put food on the table. But, you know, uh, if you're not interested to click my affiliate link, go to just just Google Daylight Computer. Uh, they're already on, on top of the SEO game uh, on, on, on Google or DuckDuckGo or anything. Thing. And I would say just uh, keep an eye on this company because you're, I'm sure you'll be surprised within a few years what they they, they come up uh, with. And I'll personally be uh, trying products and maybe trying the new phone as well. I'm very excited for you guys uh, to see what to see what's next. Really, thank you so much. Thanks, Nick. Real Take pleasure. Care. In case this wasn't already obvious, the information provided in this podcast is not intended to replace medical advice. We always recommend that you review this information with a functional medicine practitioner or environmental medicine doctor who is up to date with the latest information on the dangers of EMFs and the best practices around electro hypersensitivity, just to name these two things. And if you want to support my work, please consider sharing this episode with people you care about. You can also invest in my book, courses, or recommended products found at theemfguy.com. Thank you.